guys and see you. Hello and welcome. It's always nice to be with you today. Thank you for coming. I am uh, Nurse Linda for the Christopher and Dana Reed Paralysis Foundation. I've been a nurse for a long, long time and uh, always in rehabilitation. So I love to talk about rehabilitation things and and solve problems and you know work on issues. So thank you for coming. Um, I wanted to give everybody an update. The COVID's still out there. You know, yeah, we're still talking about that. So as you know, people who have any kind of paralysis can be immunocompromised. Nobody knows who is and who isn't or how much or how little. So we just need to take all precautions that we possibly can if you have any kind of immunocompromise at all. And so, um, you know, be sure and wash your hands, wear your mask, keep socially distanced. Um, there are treatments, there are vaccines. If you haven't uh, taken the vaccines and you, and you feel like your health allows you to do that, then you want to be sure and do that. Be sure and talk, it with you, talk about it with your own healthcare professional. Um, in children, we need to be especially careful because not all children can get the vaccine. Those under five cannot yet get it. However, there wasn't a news announcement again the other night where that under five vaccine now is coming again. It was on the news. I think we talked about it last month where it was going to come out at any moment. And then I don't know what happened. It just kind of disappeared because I kept waiting. When's it coming out? I need to have this information. And uh, I just heard the other night that, that they're working on that again. So they say it's going to be soon. So if you're interested in that, that's good. Now for children, there is um, a, a consequence of uh, COVID. Not everybody gets it. Certainly the vast majority of children that uh, have COVID, they seem to have milder cases than adults, but there are some children who get really bad cases of COVID. And there is this, um, there is this uh, consequence. It's called acute flaccid myelitis where you get really flaccid muscle muscle weakness, sometimes to the point where you have to have assistance in breathing because your breathing muscles aren't working so well. But um, this is a, a disease that's been around for a while and um, started out in about, um, well, it was first really noticed in uh, larger proportions. And by larger, I mean still very, very, very small in the total population. But it was noticed in about 2012, and they thought that it was contracted after having another virus called the enterovirus. And um, so in 2012, there was a spike. And then 2013, there wasn't. It usually comes like in the fall, winter. And then 2014, there was another spike. 15, no. 16, yes. <laughs> 17, no. 18, yes. 19, no. And then, of course, in 2020, there was a huge spike. Again, still very, very minuscule in the total population. But now they think that having um, a virus, either the enterovirus, an adenoid virus, or um, uh, the uh, COVID virus can trigger this reaction in the body. So it's something to watch out for if you have small children. Um, you will certainly want to, if they have any kind of muscle weakness, confusion, and anything that would prompt you to call, call and get help right away. You know, it's a 911 kind of situation. You want to get help right away. Um, the other thing that's going around, especially in children, is this hepatitis. You probably heard about it on the news. Um, that's, it's again, very, very, I think there's been 450 cases in the United States, which to me is a lot of cases, but in the general world, no, that's not a lot of cases, but if you're one of those 450, it's very important. So again, the uh, preventing these things are the same thing. Wash your hands thoroughly. Um, even for this hepatitis, washing your hands can really help reduce the risk of your child, or, or I suppose it'll travel to adults soon enough. Um, you know, keeping the social distance, you know, if somebody has it, you don't want to uh, be around them. Uh, you know, like a play date or something like that. So all of those kind of things are out there. Monkeypox now is a thing. These are all um, things that can be help controlled a bit by washing your hands, um, 
keeping your distance, you know, doing all these safety precautions. We know that they work. We had the big test of the COVID and indeed they work. <laughs> so please keep up those things because you really want to stay safe. Um, May 3rd this month was a big day. It was the 20th anniversary of the Paralysis Resource Center, which is an arm of the Christopher and Dana Reeve Paralysis Center. So people generally know that that uh, foundation uh, does research and they are very uh, forward in paralysis. Notice I say paralysis because a lot of times people think, well, that's spinal cord injury. No, it's all paralysis, regardless of the source of the paralysis. So um, uh, that's, that's very important work that they do. Provides a lot of hope to a lot of people. Now, I know some people are not interested in hearing about it, about research. And you know what? That's okay. Everybody comes to these things in their own time. Uh, some people are are happily living their lives the way that they are. And I say kudos to you because if you have paralysis or if you have not, finding that life satisfaction and happiness in your life seems to be evasive for so many people, especially with all the tragedies that are going on around in the world right now. I mean, and it's the whole world. Certainly our hearts go out to the families and the friends of the people in Texas, heartbreaking, heartbreaking things as the war in Ukraine, heartbreaking what people are going through right now. So it, it can really kind of weigh you down when you think about all the troubles that are going on, besides the troubles that might be going on in your own life. And, you know, as I would, I would tell my students, when people come in and they have their troubles, their troubles are the worst troubles. And so we always have to remember that when, when we're feeling things, it's okay to feel things. But if you find you're having trouble dealing with some of these things, please contact your health care professional. There is a national suicide hotline. Now, that doesn't mean you have to be suicidal to call them, but they can help you get help. They can help you direct you if you don't have a primary care physician or if you're feeling like, you know, things are really boiling up inside your 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 mind and your body, and you just want to talk to somebody, they're available. And it's kind of nice because, you know, it's, um, it's all uh, anonymous. So, you know, you don't have to give a lot of information there. But there are a lot of resources out there that can help you with that sort of thing. But the Paralysis Resource Center, I want to, I want to be sure and alert everyone to this. Because every once in a while, people say to me, oh, the Reef Foundation, that's just research. And I'm like, oh, no, they've got this whole big center to help people in the here and now. So the Christopher and Dana Reed Paralysis Foundation is really trying to have something to help everyone with paralysis. So they have the Paralysis Resource Center. So if you want to know about mental health issues, if you want to know about your bowel program, if you want to know about uh, uh, you're having a problem with your insurance and you need some advice, they're there, they, they are people that are so dedicated. They're fabulous people. I know all of them now, I think, and um, they're, just, they're just terrific, really dedicated to helping other people. So happy 20th anniversary to them. That occurred on May 3rd. That was a big day. Um, uh, I also wanna point out that, you know, not everyone in our country or even around the world has access to the web. Now it's real easy to type right on uh, the web and find the Christopher and Dana Reeve Paralysis Foundation, their links, all the information that they have, the written information. You can talk to a health uh, uh, resource information specialist, or you can get printed material. It's all free. So it's kind of wonderful. You can just, you know, log on, read about what you want to read about. That might be enough for you. You might want to talk to a person about that. Um, you can contact me through there. So there's all kinds of uh, resources um, that's available through there. So um, I did want to give, if, if you're listening, you have access to a computer, but you might know somebody who has paralysis that doesn't have access to a computer. They do have a phone number. It's in the chat box. It's 1-800-539-7309. So 1-800-539-7309. So if you, if you don't have access to the internet or you just think, I really want to talk to a human being, there you go. 
So that's really a, a great service. So, um, so getting back to the research, you know, I don't promote any products or any services. I do have biases um, and people that, that uh, listen to this webinar, or, you know, they'll know that I'm pro vaccines. That doesn't mean that everybody's eligible to have a vaccine, but I, I believe in them. So if you are eligible, if your health condition allows that, talk to your healthcare professional, get the vaccine for the COVID. Um, shingles is another one. Again, talk to your healthcare professional. There are some people who have diseases that have uh, paralysis connections that can't take some of these vaccines. So, you know, find out if you can or if you can't do what's right for you. But um, we've been doing some webinars and uh, we've talked to the people at STIMO. Now, if you uh, haven't heard about STIMO, it's a uh, uh, functional electrical implantable device, but they do have some that go on the skin and they've been having some success with putting um, implants into the spinal column and um, they're having people who are walking. There are several companies and researchers that are doing this. Um, Dr. Reggie Edgerton is also doing it here in the United States, and we're going to be having a webinar with him coming up uh, in July. The date has not, the final date has not been set, but be sure and look for that because that will be going, going on. If you're interested in the Stimo product, product um, you can go back in the blogs and you can find that uh, webinar. Uh, the company that does the STEMO is called Onward. And if you're interested in that, you might want to check into their uh, webpage so that you can get on their mailing list, their email list or whatever. They also have a device that's been tested at the University of Washington in Seattle, which is a surface electrode that goes at the base of the back of the neck. And so this is, this is used for individuals who have uh, tetraplegia or quadriplegia. Tetraplegia is the new word for quadriplegia, but not everybody's into that yet, but it restores some hand function. And so it's really had a remarkable course in that they thought they would try this out on people. And they thought maybe after many therapy sessions, people would get some hand function, be able to use it be able to use their hand. If you don't have hand function, um, this is uh, quite, the, quite the thing that people are really interested in. I get a lot of uh, requests for information about this. Um, so it's, it was tested there. It's going through the process of uh, coming out to market and they expect to have that on market in a year. Oh my gosh, this is huge. So uh, onward, there's the, the link for them is in the chat box now. So that's a pretty great thing. Um, so we will be having Dr. Edgerton talk about FES, uh, the project that he's doing. There's also a big FES center, Functional Electrical Stimulation Center in Cleveland at the Cleveland Clinic, if you wanna look at that. So there's a lot of different opportunities. Now you may not be interested in this at this point in time, and that's okay. You may wanna be interested in some of this stuff just to hear about it. You may wanna be interested because it's all future kind of things for right now, but it's moving a rapid fire pace. Uh, some people that I've talked to that have been paralyzed for quite some time is like, yeah, I've heard this all before and it's coming, it's coming. Well, this is actually coming and a lot of it is here. So um, you might want to listen to these, some of these uh, webinars, or you might want to look up some of these places, because you might find out there are things you can do now to prepare your body for when this is ready, because it's not the kind of thing that you're going to have this implant, whoa, you're going to be all better. There's a process leading up to the implant, some therapy that you'll need to have. There's a process of having the implant, and then there's a process of therapy afterwards to learn how to use it and that sort of thing. So knowledge is power. So if you're interested in any of this kind of thing, it's out there for you. If you're not interested right now, that's cool. Just, you know, if some people are, are like, I want this this afternoon, and other people are like, well, I think I'd like to wait and see how it goes before I really get involved in this. 
And that's fine. We're all different. And that's fine. But knowledge is power. So the more we know about these things, you know, the more that we can make our uh, decisions. So this month, I've been talking about um, brain injury and spinal cord injury. And a lot of times, um, you know, these are both paralysis, and they can both come from injury, uh, some kind of accident, they can both develop because of disease. Now, when you have an injury and the trauma, it's usually a very sudden kind of event where this paralysis occurs. Disease sometimes comes on more slowly. Now, if you've suddenly had a stroke, you can suddenly have paralysis. So you can be in that sudden category as well. But a lot of times some of these diseases like multiple sclerosis or um, there's a Friedrich's ataxia, the um, acute flaccid myelitis that we were talking about earlier, um, that these come on more slowly. So, um, you know, some people have a different trajectory where they're declining as their disease progresses. Some people have an auto, you know, a very sudden traumatic. So uh, the reasons why things are happening are different. The process is different, but paralysis is the end result. What a lot of people don't realize who have in particular spinal cord injury is that sometimes a traumatic brain injury goes along with that. And that is often overlooked in when you go in for your spinal cord rehab, because maybe the people who are treating you did not know what you were like before, so they don't realize that your responses are a bit slower, or maybe you're providing information that isn't quite correct in your medical history. It's usually the patient's family who will usually come up to a nurse like me and say, you know, something's not quite right. Or the nurse will be, you know, working with a patient or the therapist working with a patient because we work for much longer periods of, in, at one time. And we'll be thinking, you know, I feel like whenever I'm talking to this patient that I'm a little bit off. And that is a clue to us to say, wait a minute, I'm not a little bit off. I think this patient is maybe having a little struggle um, with uh, their, their thinking. And so then we will get a, a, a brain injury consult for that patient to see what's going on there. But a lot of times, and especially with the COVID, when a lot of family members couldn't visit, so there, were, there weren't people who really knew that patient that could say to the healthcare people providing the acute or rehabilitation care, I think that, that there's something going on uh, with their thinking. And when you think about it, if you have the force to have a spinal cord injury, even if it's lower in the spine, but if you have a traumatic injury and your body is thrown or your head is hit or your neck is hyperextended or flexed, if you think about it, this neck structure is very, very small compared to this big head that you've got sitting on top of this. So if you've had a traumatic accident that gave enough force to do something to your spine. It could have done something that jiggled your brain, could have hit up in your skull. So very often people have um, a spinal cord injury and a traumatic brain injury. Now, when you're in the rehabilitation setting, the acute care hospital, the rehabilitation setting, sometimes people are not up to their normal mental powers because they've had this huge, horrible accident. That's a blow to the system. They've maybe had surgery, so they're still kind of wearing off their anesthesia. Um, they, they're dealing with this huge catastrophic change in their life. And so sometimes this a subtle brain injury is not really noticed until people get home and they start having behavior outbursts or, you know, um, People will say, well, um, this person always took care of the finances, and I noticed there's a lot of mistakes. Sometimes the, the injury is so subtle that it's not something that's like, well, obviously there's a problem here. Sometimes it's very subtle kinds of things. It can be confused with depression. So when you go to your healthcare professional with a spinal cord injury, always say, I would like to have a little mini mental, mental exam in my regular visit, because that will kind of help them 
figure out if there's anything else going on. It also chronicles you so that your healthcare professional will see if there's a change later on. And that's an important thing to know. Last time you were here, you passed with flying colors. This time you're kind of struggling with this little bit. It might be a brain injury kind of thing. It might be a depression kind of thing, but it really helps with your whole wellness of yourself to be sure and ask for that. Because oftentimes, it, it's just not part of the usual and customary kind of exam. So um, be sure and ask for that kind of thing. Another problem that happens with any kind of neurological injury from trauma or from disease is that sometimes people get really depressed. Maybe they feel like they're not being listened to. Maybe they feel like they're being overlooked in life. Um, there's just all kinds of reasons that um, people th have pain. It can be mental pain. It can be body pain. Maybe their neuropathic pain is not being well treated or, or neuropathic pain is so hard to treat. It's a trial and error process. There is no like, oh, you have neuropathic pain. This is the, this is the answer. It's not like somebody can look at you and say, oh, you have gallbladder pain. We need to remove the gallbladder and you're all better. It's not that way. It's so subtle. Neuropathic pain is so subtle and it's different for everyone. And there's, there's like levels of treatment where, you know, you start out taking some medications. Maybe you need some stronger medications. Maybe you need a stronger dose of the medication. So it, it's, it's a process to treat that. It's a process to treat depression. Those are all processes. So sometimes people are like, oh, you know, it's, this really isn't working for me. And they'll think, well, you know, I have a few drinks that relaxes me. And it does for a while, but then the pain or the depression will come back even stronger after that. Another thing people might do is they might say, oh, you know, um, I might try some drugs of some sort. Um, it's surprising to find out statistically that people who have brain injury, the, st the statistics are that people who have a brain injury or a stroke, any kind of, from any kind of source, 50% of them have alcohol involved in that. Whoa, that's half, that's a lot. Um, if you have a spinal cord injury, the estimates are between 60 to 80% have had some kind of um, alcohol or drugs involved. Gosh, um, the reason why these statistics are so nebulous is because they're not really collected. Now, if you're in a traumatic accident and you're taken to the emergency room, blood is automatically drawn for um, alcohol or other drugs in the blood. But if you are at home and something happens, um, that blood, that test is not done, or, you know, you fall down the steps, that test is not going to be done. So that's why it's rather hard to go back and say, was, the, was alcohol or drugs involved in the accidents? But still, what we do know, it's a pretty high amount. And so a lot of people continue their drug or alcohol use from pre-injury, or they might start alcohol use after drug in injury as a way of self-treating. It's a self-treating thing. But um, if you have had a stroke or a brain injury and you're using alcohol, your incidence of having a second stroke is like really high. So you really need to think about if you want to continue that because the risk is so great that something really more could happen to you. So some people would be like, well, I don't care. What could be worse? I'll just, I'll just drink some more because it makes me feel good at the time. But really, there's so many things that are going on in healthcare today that, that um, you know, if you feel that way about how, how your current situation is, it's probably based in depression or denial of what's going on. And there's help for that. So um, trying to think about stopping an addiction is a very huge step because first of all, a lot of people don't acknowledge addiction. So if we're looking at alcohol, for men, it's four drinks a day or 14, uh, 14 drinks in a week is con considered 
an alcohol problem. Okay, for women is three drinks a day or seven per week. Now that's, to me, seems like a lot of alcohol, but um, I, I don't drink alcohol. So that, you know, seems like a lot to me, but some people say, well, okay, well, I don't, I don't drink that much. I just drink on the weekends or I just drink after work. So that's called binge drinking. And that's a problem too. It doesn't quite fit in with those categories, but that's also a problem. There are some people who don't drink all day. They go get up, go to work. They do a good job at work. They're good employees, but they drink as soon as they get home. And sometimes that alcohol is left in their body. So um, a more modern definition of alcoholism or drug addiction is if you're thinking about where your next drink is coming or when you can next participate in some using some drugs. It's that constant thinking about it, thinking about it, how I'm going to include that in my life. So people don't usually, it, it's great if you can have the wherewithal to think I might have a problem with alcohol or drugs um, drugs is even more confused. Well, alcohol is confusing too, because it's so accepted in society. People drink and that's okay. People enjoy a cocktail. But if you think you might be drinking because of something else, or if you think drugs, another thing, a lot of uh, what used to be illegal drugs are now legal drugs. So, so um, it gets very confusing, but if you think you're using drugs or alcohol to escape from some other issue, that's very hard to analyze and see in yourself. You have to really think of those things through. So that, that can be difficult, but sometimes a caring family member, um, maybe a coworker or a healthcare provider might say, you know, we need to talk about your drinking or your drug use. Uh, it's really causing a problem in your life. Um, you know, you, that is, those words are so hard to hear. And a lot of people will say, oh, get, get away from me. You know, I'm not listening to this. I don't have a problem. But if somebody says that to you, really stop and think critically about what you're doing. A lot of times people will say, well, just get away from me. I'm going to hire a new caregiver. You know, I'm not going to put up with this. Or maybe the caregiver or the family member is encouraging you uh, to drink maybe more than you want or encouraging your drug use. So it can be really tricky to decide, maybe I have a problem and I need to get help. But, but you can do it if, if you want to talk to your healthcare professional about it, if you are in counseling and want to talk about it. It's very important that you do, do it, think about it and decide. Now, um, treating an addiction is not easy. Cigarette smoking, not easy to give up. Alcohol, not easy to give up. Drugs, not easy to give up. Our body changes and looks for those kinds of things, craves those kinds of things. So there are some medications you can take to help reduce your alcohol intake, to help reduce your drug intake, but you also need a support system. So if you don't have that in your family or a caregiving situation, wherever you are, if, if you're with people who are doing that, it's very hard to sit there and say, oh, you go ahead, but I'm not going to. And then it's right in front of your face and you're like, yeah, well, I think I will. Um, so know that treating an addiction is very hard. It's not a one time and stop kind of thing. It's an ongoing process. There are many support groups. Alcohol Anonymous is uh, the most uh, commonly known one, but there are other support groups too that work on different processes that might be better for you. So if you, if you think you're having uh, trouble with addiction and you wanna stop and you try and you fail, okay, I gotta start again. You might still fail a couple of times, you might fail 10 times, but each time you're getting closer, each time you're making progress. So those are important things um, to think about and to deal with. So with that, I just want to encourage you because any kind of addiction is very difficult and there are all kinds of addictions. Some people have sex addictions. Some people are addicted to food. Um, there's just uh, video games. Oh my gosh. 
I know sometimes I get playing and I just, I just love it. It takes up my mind and I concentrate on that game and my problems go away. Sometimes I find myself playing there too long and I think, okay, time to step away. Oh, one more game. Oh, one more game. Oh no, Linda, step away. So, you know, it's, there's, there's all kinds of addictions and finding those and treating those can be really difficult. So some questions, but it's possible. You can do it and everybody can do it. You are no exception. You may be have done it 20 times, but the 21st time might be the charm. So don't ever think you can't do it because you can do anything you want. You can. And so just, you know, keep trying, just keep trying, surround yourself with people who are encouraging you, but keep trying. So the first question is about spinal cord injuries and the weather. Okay, there's a couple of things to think about spinal cord injuries and the weather. Number one, weather can affect your body. If you have a spinal cord injury, if you have a brain injury, if you have arthritis, if you have really no health care conditions, weather can affect your body. So we've been having a lot of rain across the country, and you know that can make people's joints a little stiff. When the barometric pressure changes. I don't really understand all how that works, but I know when they talk about the barometric pressure, people sometimes when it's going up, when it's going down, it can affect your body and how you're feeling. So all these kind of weather in general can affect how you feel. Humidity is another big effect. Okay. We know about hot and cold temperatures. It's really cold. We have to dress warmer. If it's really hot, we want the air conditioning on but humidity is more pervasive. So I wanna mention humidity because humidity can really make you feel bogged down, can really make you uncomfortable. It collects in your body. It doesn't diffuse like if you're hot and you go in an air conditioned space, you'll cool down after a while. Um, humidity collects in there, it's really hard to get rid of really hard. So you want to, you want to avoid, if you have any kind of neurological problem, you want to avoid humidity. I don't have a neurological problem, but I avoid humidity because it's really hard for me to move. I get grumpy and I just don't feel well. So I think, oh, if it's real humid, I'll just stay in my AC. Thank you very much. But that's my personal choice. So um, after you have spinal cord injury or brain injury, if you have injury to that autonomic nervous system, the ANS we talk so much about, it controls all the automatic things in your body. So after you have a spinal cord injury and that ANS is affected, or if you have a brain injury and your ANS is affected, you might not be able to regulate your body temperature like you did before. Now, in a spinal cord injury, those nerves and muscles are still working below your level of injury. They just can't get the message up to the brain that I'm too hot or I'm too cold. The message can't get down to the lower part of the body, wherever the injury is. That message can't get down to open your blood vessels more, or uh, you know, you're feeling really hot or you're getting frostbitten little toes from being uh, out in the cold. If you have a brain injury or a stroke, it's the brain might not be able to rec recognize or control that message. So the problem is in the brain. In the spinal cord injury, the problem is in the spinal cord. So there, there are two different problems, but kind of the same outcomes. So a lot of times people don't feel the cold and they don't dress for it. And I know at the local high school, there's a fellow that comes and um, I talked to him. He's um, what I would say is apparently tetraplegic. And he'll say, oh, I don't feel the cold. And I said, you know, you really should put your, should cover your feet. It's always wearing sandals. And he's like, no, I don't feel it. So it really doesn't matter. But it does matter because that cold is still affecting your skin. The frostbite can still happen. It's still affecting the, the thermatic uh, influences of your body. Uh, same thing for in the summertime, people, sometimes they don't dress in layers. You can still go out in the warm. Um, you can still go out in the humidity, but prepare for it. Bring some cooling towels, um, fan yourself, sit in the shade, bring a, bring a giant umbrella, uh, something to do to help yourself 
don't stay out too long so that you don't get um, heat stroke or that heat intensity that, you know, it will take you a longer time to cool off or to warm up. If you have problems with your autonomic nervous system, you can put on blankets if you're cold. You can get in air conditioning or fan yourself or cool yourself in some way. But sometimes, because it's the autonomic nervous system, the only way you can get your body temperature reset is to go, go back, to, is to take a nap, go to sleep. And when you wake up, your brain has kind of uh, reset itself. So that is that I, I tell that to a lot of people and they're like, oh, yeah, I do. Once I get really cold or once I get really hot, I just want to take a nap. And when I wake up, I feel OK again. So it's just that one of those little nuances of the autonomic nervous system. Now, the autonomic nervous system, they are doing some work on that um, to try to uh, help with autonomic problems. So it does things like um, uh, spasms, orthostatic hypotension. So you get dizzy when you sit up or stand up, um, temperature regulation, uh, just all kinds of things it does. So they're working on a bowel control, getting your bowel to function at a normal rate. So they're working at, and this is just starting. This is just new. Well, just starting, but they've been doing it for a while, but it's in the early stages of trying to figure out how they can treat one thing, the autonomic nervous system, instead of treating all these separate little, little actions. So that's something that's on the way. It's so kind of nice to know it's on the way. Okay, so there's a question that somebody wrote in. How can, what can you say about using Botox injections for lightening of leg muscles? lessening the ability uh, to spread the legs, um, short-term use, long-term use. I'm paraplegic and a walker and cast, so she needs to have this uh, information so that she can catheterize herself. Well, Botox is the primary treatment right now for any kind of spasticity. So legs, arms, um, if you have a, a spastic bladder, they put it there. Um, they actually do injections in your bladder. Um, that's not your question, but the, yours is about the legs. But if you have a migraine headache, they're putting some Botox in the back of your head. And that's really uh, working out pe well for people who are having migraine headaches. Uh, it does not go into your brain. And it's just in the, under the skin in the back of your head, but it seems to relax the muscles back here, which seems to affect people's migraines. So it's good for all kinds of things. Now, um, a treatment, the lowest level treatment for spasticity is range of motion. If you fatigue those muscles by using those muscles, they become less spastic. That works well for some people. It works well for a while, but spasticity kind of builds over time. So it might not work for the long haul, but it can work in the short term. And the next thing to do is to look at um, medications, oral medications. And that was the treatment of choice for a long time, but people didn't like taking those because they make their head foggy. Oral medications work completely throughout your body. You know, it's like an aspirin. People will say, well, how do I know if I take a Tylenol or an aspirin? How do I, know, how does it know exactly where to go? Well, it doesn't, it works throughout your whole body. So um, these um, antispasmodic medications do the same. Uh, some people take, um, small, tiny bits of antidepressant medication. So like um, if you treating depression, you might take 200, 300 milligrams of a drug. To treat spasticity, you might take five or 10 milligrams of that same drug. Um, Antispasmatic medicine, anti-seizure medicine, a side effect is it helps control spasticity. So if you're on those medications anyway, you're probably having less spasticity than somebody who doesn't take those medications. So that can be a two for kind of treatment. So that's the next level. Then the next level was Botox, but now that's the premier level. And uh, so what they do is they inject the Botox. It's uh, botul botulinum uh, toxin. So little tiny amounts. It damages a little tiny bit of that muscle that they injected in. And if you have spasms in the legs or, you know, big body parts, 
you need to use a lot of Botox. Now, the thing about Botox is it will damage that muscle, but not permanently. The muscle will grow back because it doesn't, you don't take out the whole muscle. It just does a little bit here. So it weakens the muscle. Let's put it that way. It weakens the muscle. So that spasticity gets under control, but the muscle will grow back. So you have to continually go back and have more Botox injections. So if you don't have very bad spasticity, um, you might have to go back like every six months. That's not too bad. Um, if you have a more severe spasticity, you might have to go back every three or four months. So it depends on what you have. You want to have somebody inject you who does these injections because, again, it's kind of um, operator guided. So they know how much a muscle needs about this much. They look at the amount of spasticity. They do tests, you know, to measure how much spasticity you have in any particular uh, body part. And then they have experience with how much they should give you. So sometimes they might give you a little too little to start. And you might say, well, this worked out really well. It wore off too quick, or it lessened my spasticity, but it didn't completely do the job that I would have liked to have had so they can bump it up the next time. Sometimes they might give you a little too much and so that might make you a little too flaccid. Um, so maybe you don't need that much, but they're pretty good at starting out at lower levels and then trying to get where, where you need to go. If you're having Botox up closer to your head, it can interrupt with your breathing so you want to be very careful about where you're having the Botox. It's usually in the arms and legs. Um, sometimes people have it in their back if they have uh, very bad back spasms, um, but it's in the muscles. So that's where it goes. Um, there are some people who have a little bit of spasticity and they use that spasticity for transfers. So they don't want all of their spasticity taken away. They just want enough so they can um, relieve their discomfort or their spas spasticity, or maybe uh, they don't like the visual of the spasticity, or um, maybe they have pain with their spasticity. So you need to talk with whomever's going to be giving you these Botox injections on what you want and what you don't want. So if you want enough that you can catheterize effectively so they can take care of those, those muscles, um, so that you can do that versus taking away all the spasticity in your legs that you might use to help you transfer. So you see, that would be a piece of information that they, they would need. So this person says they use a walker and a wheelchair. So if they're using the walker without braces, they might be relying on their spasticity. So be sure and tell them, I particularly um, need this for catheterization. So, you know, that's, that's a very important thing to do. Um, there are also other ways that you can do catheterization. Uh, if the spasticity, I'm, I'm going to go on. This is not the question asked, but I'm going to go on. If uh, spasticity is so bad, especially in females who have to position themselves to catheterize, if it becomes so um, disruptive, you can catheterize by placing one leg up on the toilet um, that kind of helps um, position differently. You can, um, there's also uh, procedures that you can have done. One is the mitral fan off, or you catheterize through your belly button. Now, I wouldn't say this is the next thing you should go out and do. I think this person is looking for the Botox. You should try the Botox. That will probably take care of the problem that you're having. But if it should become, it should come a time that you want to do something differently, this mitral fan off, they uh, use the belly button. They uh, go through and take usually a little piece of uh, your appendix, you know, which is an organ that you don't really need. They attach that to the backside of the belly button and to the top of the bladder and you catheterize through there. So that takes care of a lot of issues there. I just mentioned that as a, a sideline because a lot of people are listening and they, you know, they'd be like, huh, that's kind of interesting. Um, so that's a very safe procedure. It started out in children and uh, adult people use it all the time, mostly females, but some males also use it too if they had a re have a retracted penis 
or maybe they have a, a pendulous abdomen and they can't get to, to the area where they need to catheterize. So that's something. Back to the question about uh, the Botox. Um, sometimes spasticity is so bad that people have an implant. Maybe they've taken the oral medication, they've done the Botox, but their spasticity is still uh, pervasive. And so they have an implant put in. It's a little, um, looks like a cardiac pacemaker. It's a little reservoir that goes in the front in the abdomen and then a little tube wraps around into the back and they put it in the spinal canal, not in the spine, in the spinal canal where the spinal fluid is. And it bathes the spinal column with um, baclofen more at a higher quantity than you can take by mouth. You don't get the head effects. So it's a really good um, alternative treatment for the most severe. So that's kind of like the whole gamut of spasticity going through the levels. There are also some uh, surgeries that they can do or injections they can do to deaden the nerve. Um, but those aren't really recommended now because these treatments for uh, spinal cord injury are coming fast and furious, and we want to have those nerves available at that time. But in the most extreme cases, some people are like, okay, I'm just going to do this. And that's, you know, just what I'm going to do. So hopefully that has answered the question about that. Um, Oh, so please, how you're using spasticity, what is included? That is, the new word for spasticity is tone. So you might hear healthcare professionals talk about tone, spasticity, it's the same thing. So spasticities are when muscles contract, um, and it's usually the muscles that draw your body part towards your body. So we have muscles that push away and we have muscles that pull. The muscles that pull towards the body are a little bit stronger than the muscles that pull away. So when you see spasticity, it might be that there might just be a quiver. You might see a quiver under that muscle, under your skin where that muscle is. It might just be quivering. Um, sometimes spasticity is that it's drawing it's drawing the body part in towards the body. And a lot of times those can be relaxed with um, uh, range of motion exercises and those that can be stretched out. And you need to do that if you have spasticity because if it's just held in this position for a long time, you can develop a contracture where you, the muscles shorten and you can no longer pull those out. So that ends up into a whole lot of complications because then the contracture has to be um, either pulled out by using serial casting where it'll pull out like a little every two weeks until you get those flaccid, until you get those uh, mobile again, or, um, you might have to have surgery to help ex, uh, extend those muscles. So spasticity is when that muscle is contracting. You don't want it to contract, but it's contracting. Inside our muscles, there's an autom automatic muscle uh, redundant system. So muscles want to move and they need that contraction, flexion and contraction. They require that. If, you, if you're not doing that due to immobility, your muscles are going to want to contract and those stronger ones are gonna contract. So that's what I'm talking about in spasticity is when the muscles are contracting, but they're not, uh, uh, you, it takes some effort to get that muscle to relax that spasm that's in the muscle that's causing that. Okay, we have one more question here. Um, I hope that answered your question. If you have another one, just go ahead. If I haven't been clear, go ahead and type it right on in because I want to I wanna be sure and be clear about everything. So um, there's another question here. It's about uh, tetraplegics labeled it as Asia D and pain control. This is another big, big question. Um, so, oh, thank you. <laughs> thank you for that, for those kind words there, Bonnie. Um, so um, Asia D, so... People who have spinal cord injury know about the classification system. It's uh, called the Asia ASIA, American Spinal Injury Association Classification System. And it consists of two parts, 
One is the level. So at what vertebrae, uh, what um, level of your spinal cord um, ha has been harmed, has some damage. So that's the level. And, you know, that's like uh, C3, 4, uh, the T's are 1 through 12, the sacral, you know, those are it, it, what what level of the spine and what vertebrae of the spine. So that's where we get that information. Then the second part of the Asia exam is um, this cl classification, A, B, C, D, E. So A is a complete injury, not complete severing of your spinal cord. I always point that out because people are told if you have a complete injury, your spinal cord is completely severed because that's what the Asia scale says. No, the Asia scale does not say that. The complete means that the message is not getting from the brain completely down to the end of the spinal cord. It has nothing to do with severing, not one single thing. So if you've been told your spinal cord is severed, probably has not been. That is so extremely rare, so extremely rare. You might have damage at that level, but there's still some threads that are going through. I can pretty much guarantee you. Um, so, um, this Asia scale now it's called here again, this is like the third time I, but now it's called the AIS scale. People still call it the Asia scale. We all know it by the name of the Asia scale, but now it's called the AIS scale. Um, American, oh, I forget what it even stands for now, but it's now called the AIS, but everybody knows it as the a Asia scale in the United States. In Europe, they use the Frankel scale. It's kind of the same thing, but there's some subtle little differences. Well, anyway, so Asia A is there's a complete injury, not a complete severing. Asia B is you have sensory, but you have no motor control. We see this a lot with um, the spinal cord uh, syndromes, like um, um, posterior cord syndrome, cotoquina syndrome, you see a lot of those. Uh, there, but you can get it also from trauma. Um, the Asia uh, C is incomplete, but it's um, you have motor less motor function less than grade three uh, below the level of injury, and then D is you have motor function. Um, uh, motor two is greater than uh, grade three. I'm so sorry. Um, I'm, there's some noise going on over there. Um, so, okay, C is incomplete. You have motor scale of greater than three, a grade three. So you have some movement below the level of injury. D, you have incomplete, uh, is an incomplete injury with motor less than three below the level of injury. So three or D, that's where we are with you. Okay, and then E, there is an E, if you can believe this, motor and sensory is functional. So somebody's had an injury to their spinal cord, but they've actually recovered. And yes, this actually happens. Uh, sometimes when you see the football players out there and uh, they get taken off the field, they're paralyzed, everybody's in a panic, worried. And then later on, they come back, they don't come back to play a football because it's too dangerous now for their spinal cord, but they come back and they're pretty much functional. Those are called stingers. So some people have a stinger accident where their spinal cord gets bumped, but then it heals itself and through therapy and different endeavors, then um, they are classified then as level, as level E. So um, pain control and level D. When you have pain control and you have a spinal cord injury, usually the pain is because messages are not being translated, transferred correctly to the brain. So since this is level D, there's some messages that are getting through to the brain, but they're probably not getting through correctly. So there are many different kinds of pain. Um, you know, there's pain that you have after surgery. That's one kind of pain. <clears throat> There's also pain that people have that's muscle pain. So from overusing your muscles. So if you are um, have arm function and you're transferring with your arms or you're walking with a walker and you're holding your body up, those muscles can get worn out 
from holding your body up and that's muscular pain. Um, at the zone of transition, so where your body goes from not having paralysis to where your body goes to having paralysis, those muscles right up above that zone of transition can become very fatigued because they're holding the rest, the upper part of your body up, or those muscles below the level of injury are not working so well. So those muscles can become fatigued. And sometimes people have a lot of muscular pain at the zone of trans transition. But for those people who are having neuropathic pain, that pain is very hard to treat. And that's what, that's what um, the, um, that's what um, I was talking about earlier with treating that neuropathic pain. So there's different medications that you can take. Sometimes you can start out with a gentle movement, much like spasticity, and that will help reduce the neuropathic pain. Now, people want to do their exercises. They want to get up done. And you know, it's like, no, when, you, when you're working your muscles and you're having neuropathic pain or really any any time you're doing your range of motion, you want to stretch gently and slowly. You know, if you think about people who have arthritis, that's a different kind of pain, but um, gentle movement helps them. People who have multiple sclerosis, gentle movement. Gentle movement will help your neuropathic pain and it doesn't trigger spasticity, you know, so somebody won't clam up because they're they're uh, moving so quickly. So gentle, start out with gentle movement. You can add on oral medications. That's uh, another thing that you can do. You can do um, uh, nerve blocks. So they have uh, electrical systems that just block nerve pain. You wear them on the outside of your body. There's nerve blocks from within the body, but, but again, that's, that's, you, you want, don't want to, tempt that. You want to leave that alone for right now. But you can get these devices if it's a loc if it's a location where it's just right here. Um, you can get a you can get one of these devices that will block that pain. You can get injections into that area that will help reduce the pain, uh, different from the spasticity injections. So those are all those are all kind of the level of treatment. They're kind of the same. There are different medications and different things that you're doing, but you start out with some physical movement, add some oral medications, maybe get some uh, devices for the neuropathic pain, um, maybe a pump for a Botox or pump injections. It all kind of follows the same hierarchy of treatments. So that's kind of interesting, but you know, it is the way it is. Um, there's one more quick question in here about uh, with summer coming, Sweating below the injury and how can sweat contrib contribute to skin issues? Well, thank you, Kim. Um, and next month, it's all about skin, thinking differently about skin. So sweat is a toxic chemical. Who knew? Um, it has enzymes in it. Urine and stool do as well. They have a lot more than sweat. But when you get all sweaty, and sometimes people below the level of their injury, most people don't sweat below the level of their injury. Some people sweat profusely. It's a smaller number of people, but I mean, the sweat just comes. It's a problem with that autonomic nervous system, mixed messages. So sometimes if you're sweating, that means some message is getting through and the autonomic nervous system is saying, go full force, baby. We don't know what's going on. Just go for full force. So there are treatments that can be done to be, to help you with your sweating. Um, uh, there's, a, there's all different kinds of treatments. So um, you would need to talk to your healthcare professional because there are um, ion, 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 ion phoresis treatments. Um, there are different uh, chemicals you can buy. There's some lotion that you can put on that stops sweating. But if you, you have a big enough area, you would want to uh, not like put it over your whole body because that's going to cause a problem if your body's trying to sweat, but the sweat can't get out. Um, but if you have a small patch where it's sweating, sometimes you can use those. So um, sweating can be quite a problem. You want to be sure and uh, dress for the weather. 
So if you can take off layers of clothes, that would be helpful. Um, if you're wearing an adult containment garment, so, you know, like it depends, or if you have an external catheter and you're having a sweating problem, you want to take off any, any kind of garment or bed overlay if you're using um, an absorbent pad in your bed because that doesn't let moisture in or out. So that contains the sweat in that area. You wanna be sure and remove those for a particular point of the day if sweating is going on and um, cleanse your skin really well, dry it really well because um, damp skin can, can create more moisture. Um, so dry it really well and then leave those off and let your skin air for a while. That's really important. Um, so sweating, sweating can contribute to skin issues because if it gets in the creases, if it stays on your skin too long, the enzymes in there can start eating away at the top layer of your skin. Well, you don't want that to happen. So if you do find you're sweating a lot, if you can change your clothes, you can use it. Um, uh, towel. Now, some people will want to keep that layer of sweat. If it's just you get a layer of sweat, it's not dripping down you. Some people will want to keep that layer of sweat there. So you don't want to like be constantly, constantly blotting, but periodically change your clothes and get that sweat off your skin. Because if you're sweating, say from the chest down or your, your legs are sweating, uh, below that level of injury, you're going to dehydrate really quickly. So applying some moisture to your skin will help because then the body thinks it's got moisture, you know, an amalia lotion. Um, use some kind of uh, lotion that is not heavily perfumed or, you know, not like a skin hand cream that, you know, is going to uh, you need that big guns kind of lotions, like I'll say Eucerin or um, people find a lot of luck with Aveeno, but those kinds of uh, skin creams that don't have fragrance, fragrance in it to further irritate your skin. Uh, some people who are diabetic have really dry skin from, it's an internal process that dries their skin. So they use that diabetic uh, dry skin lotion and putting that moisture on the outside of your body makes the skin think that your body is already has enough moisture on the skin. So that kind of helps sometimes too. But you can get some help through your healthcare professional to help that. Otherwise, um, change, your, change your clothes, wear cotton um, garments, change your clothes. If they get completely drenched, uh, change your clothes. Otherwise, um, you know, for excessive sweating, we all sweat a bit and it just gets absorbed in our clothes and gets wicked away from our body. Those uh, wicking clothes that wick moisture away from your body is also uh, very important. But um, that sweating can be such a huge problem and you do not have to tolerate that. Um, you can get medications from your physician that will help um, stop that sweating process. So be sure and talk to your healthcare professional about what the exact right treatment for you is. Uh, many people are on uh, bladder management programs and they can't just drink, drink, drink. Um, you do need to drink when you get dehydrated, you need to get some more fluids in your body, but you need to think about how you're gonna balance that. You can't drink, drink, drink if you have um, um, problems with, or if you have a, a ma bladder management program, you have to control your fluids. But if you can, you don't want to drink, 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 because you're going to overwhelm your heart. You want to um, slow down on the sweet drinks, the alcohol drinks. Um, just basic water is the best. Um, and then uh, change your clothes frequently, but talk to your healthcare professional because you can get treatment for those for that hyper sweating. And so with that, I'll say thank you for coming. Um, since we are in such an issue with what's going on in the world, in our own country, we've just had this horrible, horrible tragedy that's just heart wrenching, wrenching as they all are. And we think, where's the end coming? Um, 
so many problems in the world, so many problems that we all have in our own lives. So in thinking about your mental health, um, the best thing we can do is to help other people the best way we can. And some ways that's so easy is whoever you see, whoever you're interacting with, ask them how they're doing. Ask them how their life is going. Um, it might be a, a family member. It might be a caregiver. It might be somebody that, you know, you talk to socially. Just how are you doing? How are you, how are you handling all the things that are going on? And, you know, have, know that somebody is thinking about you can just warm your heart so much. It might be just the thing that somebody needs. Somebody can be having a really down day. You pass them out on the street. You say, hello, how you doing? And they'll be like, oh, fine, will be their automatic response. Um, to somebody closer to you, you can get more in depth with it. But that hello might be just the thing that, oh, somebody paid attention to me. So that's a good place to start. On that note, I'll say uh, goodbye and thank you for coming. I hope to see you next month. And uh, I look forward to talking to you again.